So I'm going to, I'm going to get started because this is a program I've been looking forward to for quite some time. And, um, I'm Meg Weston. I'm the founder and director of the Poets' Corner. And for those of you who don't know or who are new to us, and many of you have been with us many times before, but for those who are new, the Poets' Corner was founded in June of 2020 to create community among writers and readers of poetry and short prose. And as you might recall, back then we were all sheltered in and somewhat isolated. And those of us who are writers really felt that strong need for community. And today we have more than 4,500 people from around the world who have joined in our, on our mailing list and who join us for readings every month. We have a reading on the second, usually it's the second Sunday of every month, and a little bit about what's coming up. All of those second Sunday readings are free. We do record them, so the recordings are available on the website in a day or two, um, and you can go back and listen again or share them with friends who didn't get to hear what we've what you loved, um, and I usually let everybody who registered know, so in case somebody missed it and wants to hear it, they can come back to it. So a little bit about events that are coming up on the Poets' Corner before we get started on today's event. Um, well, first I have to say that we're being joined today by Chris Nelson of Green Linden Press, and you may have Remember, if you were here a year ago, just about a year ago, Chris um, was with us for a reading of Mark Burroughs' translation of the poems of Hilda Domine. And that's when I first met him. And his press is just a remarkable small press that publishes works in translation and other works that are important for us to connect ourselves through our humanity. And someone wrote to me today before, um, before the event and said, thank you for bringing us international poetry as well. Um, it's important for those of us who are Americans, American writers to hear those voices from other places around the world. Um, next month, we also are featuring an anthology that Green Linden Press has published called uh, Essential Queer Voices in U.S. Poetry. And we'll have, I believe there are six, five or six readers, poets that are included in the anthology. There's Rick Barrett, uh, Richard Blanco, Ellen Bass, um, I'm trying to think of who else, Lee Ann Rur Rurpa and um, Sharif Shanigan. Did I forget anybody, Chris? I hope not. I think, okay. The, the, a fabulous lineup of poets that are coming to us on April 14th. So come back for that. And in May, if you happen to be on the East Coast and anywhere near Camden, Maine, we have the Camden festival of poetry happening on May 18th. And that is uh, free and open to the public all afternoon of poetry. And the featured keynote is Padraig Otuma, the Irish poet, peace activist, host of a very popular podcast called Poetry Unbound, which is part of Krista Tibbetts on Being Network. And if you're not in the local area or can't come to Camden, Maine, you're welcome to sign up for a craft talk that Padraig is doing um, in conjunction with the festival on Friday, May 17th from 2 to 4 p.m. And it's it will be broadcast virtually. You can sign up on our website, thepoetscorner.org slash craft talks. Uh, there is charge for the craft talk, but it's a nominal fee, 
and the opportunity to listen to Padre talk about the address of poetry. It's called you, 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 the address of poetry. So to talk about the craft of poetry is a delight. Or come the next day in person and listen to him read his poems. I think that's it for upcoming events. We've closed submissions for our chapbook contest. So stay tuned for the winner of the chapbook contest to be announced on during the festival on May 18th. And they will have a reading in our for our June lineup along with the chapbook contest judge, Marie Howe. So with that, I'm going to turn to today's event because this is a very exciting day for us afternoon. Um, Chris Nelson, as I mentioned, will be introducing. He's a poet. He's the publisher of Green Linden Press, founder and publisher of Green Linden Press, and brings to us Philip Metris, um, who is a poet himself and translator of Russian poetry. And for me, there is a personal connection. And I think for each of us, we find those personal connections. I studied Russian in high school during the Cold War. I always wanted to connect with, um, I wanted to go to Russia and I didn't get to go until 2001. I traveled to the Far East and in 2019 had an opportunity to visit St. Petersburg. But today we're back in a situation that feels so much like the Cold War since the war in Ukraine began. And Gandalevsky, who is the celebrated Russian poet, is now living in exile in the country of Georgia, where it is the middle of the night. So he will be us with us by video only uh, because it is the middle of the night. Um, but we will feel his presence here today. And my second real connection is that I'm married to a man who spent four years as a foreign correspondent in Moscow in the 70s and worked with the Russian dissidents. And it's so interesting to hear those stories and to think about today how poetry and literature can connect us with the people of a country, aside from the politics that keep us apart. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Nelson to do the rest of the introductions for today's program. Thank you. And thank you, Meg, uh, for the kind words and for um, creating such a wonderful community around poetry and for being the champion of Greenland and Press's work. I appreciate it greatly. Um, I'm going to say just a little bit about Greenland and Press. Um, we're an independent publisher of poetry books, broadsides, and a biannual journal called Under a Warm Green Linden. We're a nonprofit organization dedicated to fostering excellent literature and to supporting reforestation. With the help of our readers, we have planted 750 trees. I would encourage you to visit our website, look at our catalog at greenlandandpress.com, and consider making a tax deductible donation if you uh, believe in our mission. Thank you. Sergei Gandlevsky is one of the most celebrated contemporary Russian poets. Born in 1952, a year before Stalin's death, he opted out of the Soviet system, working odd jobs and only sharing poetry with a small group of friends. An integral figure, figure in the Russian underground poetry scene, his work didn't appear in literary journals until the late 1980s during Glasnost. And since the fall of the Soviet Union, his poetry and prose have received nearly every major Russian literary prize. A Russian critics poll in the early 2000s named him the country's most important living poet. Since 1993, Gandlevsky has worked at the journal Foreign Literature, 
a lifelong Muscovite. He has relocated, as Meg said, to the Republic of Georgia since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. His poetry is a surprising combination of rough and tumble carousing and a candid sensitivity. His diction, at times coarse as street slang, is married to a sonorous musicality. Of his work, Ilya Kaminsky writes, this is the kind of poetry that sets time to music and captures the epoch's tone in vivid images making emotion visible, thought felt, and history sensed." End quote. It's been an honor for Green Linden Press to be entrusted with Philip Metris's brilliant translations of decades of Gendlewski's work. Um, it's been a delight and an honor for me as well to um, be part of the process of having these poems make their way to an English audience or English speaking audiences. Philip Metris is the author of 12 books, including most recently, Fugitive Refuge and Shrapnel Maps, both with Copper Canyon Press and The Sound of Listening, Poetry as Refuge and Resistance. Among his honors are fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Lannan Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and three Arab American Book Awards. His translations have been honored with a Penn Heim Translation Grant and the Stephen Mitchell Prize for Excellence in Translation from Greenland and Press, for which Oker and Russ, the new selected poems of Sergei Gendlewski, um, was the recipient. He is Professor of English and Director of the Peace, Justice, and Human Rights Program at John Carroll University in Cleveland, Ohio. Please help me welcome Philip Metris. <laughs> hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, thank you, Christopher, um, for really editing and publishing this gorgeous volume through Greenland and Press. And thanks to Meg Weston and everybody at Poets Corner for hosting and creating this space where there are so many lovely readers. I, I can't believe there are 100 participants on Zoom still in this, uh, the fourth year of our weird pandemic, this unfolding. Um, very grateful for your attention. And I will try to uh, share with you the best I can a bit of the spirit of Gondolevsky. Suryoja at this point is uh, in dreamland, sleeping halfway through the night. However, I found a really, really good video of him reciting some of his poems. So for the first kind of half of, the, um, of this presentation, I'm going to sort of toggle between his recitations, um, a video of his recitations, and then the translations. Um, and of course, if you have comments or questions as we go on, you know, please feel free to use the chat or however. It is, it is customary for the space, um, but I, I welcome them. I wanna make sure that you uh, have an experience of poetry today, such that um, as I had when I was 22 years old, living in Russia, um, hearing Gonlevsky and others read, just a totally immersive sort of waterfall of language. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna have him recite the first poem and then I will read the translation. And, um, and then we'll go from there. So I'm gonna share my screen and see if we can get old Sergei to show up here. Oops, I'm gonna try one more time, sorry. I've got to do something very important. Optimize, okay, it's good, it's optimized. All right, so one of the things you'll notice as he reads is that uh, he's not consulting the page. Gonlewski has not simply memorized all of his poems, but in fact, he has composed them in his mind. And so it's just simply recalling them. So here's the first poem. Я признателен Михаилу Куркину за внимание. И 
У меня есть такая программа на час чтения. Два раза по полчаса или один раз за час. На ваше усмотрение или на мое, если я почувствую, что совсем я уже вдыхаюсь, я попрошу вас сделать пяти или десятиминутный перерыв. Вот. Это ну, стихи, которые я отобрал за всю свою жизнь. Вот, собственно, я их и буду читать. Самосуд неожиданной зрелости – это зрелище средней руки, Лишено общепризнанной прелести выйти на берег тихой реки, Рефлектируя в рифму. Молчание – речь мою караулит давно. Бархударов, Крючков и компания – разве это нам свыше дано? Есть обычаи у русской поэзии с отвращением бить зеркала или прятать кухонное лезвие в ящик письменного стола. Дядя в шляпе, испачканный голубем, отразился в трофейном трюмо. Не мори меня творческим голодом, так оно получилось само. Было вроде кораблика, ялика, воробья на пустом гамаке. Это облако, нет, это яблоко. Это азбука в женской руке. Это азбучные нежности навыки. Скрип уключен по дачным прудам, лижет саде. Просится на руки, я тебя никому не отдам. Стала барщиной, ревностью, мукою, Расплескался по капле мотив, В сухомятку мычу и мяукую, Пятернями башку обхватив. Для чего мне досталось в наследие Чья-то маска с двусмысленным ртом, Одна актовой жизни трагедия, Диалог резонера с шутом. Для чего моя музыка зыбкая? Объясни мне, когда я умру, ты сидела с недоброй улыбкой на одном бесконечном перу И морочила сонного отрока скатерть праздничную теребя. Это яблоко, нет, это облако, и пощады не жду от тебя. The lynch law of sudden maturity, this spectacle of mediocrity lacks the general pleasure of walking the shore of a quiet river, reflecting in rhyme. Silence too long has guarded my words. Tell me, my great grammarians, is speech a gift from the gods? In Russian poetry, there's a tradition of breaking mirrors with disgust or hiding knives from the kitchen in the drawers of writing desks. A guy in a hat spattered by a pigeon reflected in a pier glass, a spoil of the war. Don't starve me with creative hunger. That's come quite unbidden. It was like a ship, a yawl, sparrows in an empty hammock. Is it a pall? No, it's an apple an alphabet in a woman's hand, the alphabet of tender habits, scrape of orlocks on dacha ponds. She licks a scab, asks to be stroked. I won't give you up to anyone. Slavery, jealousy, and torture, themes spilling drop by drop. I moo, mew, eat dry crusts without water, hiding my head in my palms. Why must I have as my inheritance a mask with an ambiguous smile, the tragedy of a one-act existence, a preacher's dialogue with a fool. My unsteady music, why? Explain to me when I die, why you sat with an unkind smile and fooled the dreamy child and plucked at the tablecloth at an endless holiday party. Is it an apple? No, it's a pall. I don't expect you to have mercy. Слышно? Да, хорошо. Вот наша улица, допустим, Орджоникид Дзержинского. 
родня советским захолустьем, но это все-таки Москва. Вдали допорщатся массивы, промышленности некрасивый, каркасы, трубы, корпуса настырно лезут в небеса. Как видишь, нет примет особых. Аптека, очередь, фонарь под глазом бабы, всюду гарь, рабочие в пунцовых робах, дорогу много лет подряд мастят, ломают, матерят. Вот автор данного шедевра, вдыхая липы и бензин, 14 порожних евро бутылок тащит в магазин. Вот женщина немолодая, хорошая, почти святая, из детской лейки на цветы побрызгала и с высоты балкона смотрит на дорогу. На кухне булькает обед, в квартирах вспыхивает свет, ее обманывали много. Родня, любовники, мужья, сегодня очередь моя. Мы здесь росли и превратились в угрюмых дяди, глупых теть. Скучали, малость развратились. Вот наша улица Господь здесь с Акуджавовской пластинкой, Староарбатскую грустинкой. Годами прячут шиш в карман, Испепеляют, как древлян, свои дурацкие надежды. С детьми играют в города, Чита, Сучан, Караганда, Ветша. Лица и одежды бездельничают рыбаки, у мертвой я у за реки. Такая вот, як на потофа, доигрывает в спорт лото последний тур, а до потопа рукой подать, гадает, кто всему виною, Пушкин, что ли? Мы сдали напить в этой школе науку страха и стыда. Жизнь кончится, и навсегда умолкнут брани пересуды Под небом старого двора, но знала чертова дыра Родство сиротства, мы отсюда Так по родимому пятну детей искали в старину. Another gorgeous one from Seryoja. Um, so, yeah, this is um, this is a poem that's written in what would be called in the, in the Russian the Anegin stanzas. So uh, Pushkin, the famous Alexander Pushkin, wrote a, a, a long work, um, which is essentially a novel in verse, um, called Yevgeny Anegin. And uh, every stanza of this work is the exact same, these sort of longest stanzas, but uh, Gunlevsky has used the exact same sort of uh, formal structure to uh, share a portrait of contemporary life, such as he knew it in um, the 70s in Moscow. Um, there's, there are a couple references here that I'll just flag for you. Um, one is that uh, during the Soviet period, obviously many uh, streets were renamed after Soviet heroes in quotation marks, such as they are, right? So um, the, there's a joke in the second line that if you're not, if you're a Russian, not a Russian, you wouldn't get, um, he's combined, he's made a portmanteau of two uh, Soviet hero uh, names, um, Argeny Kidze and Zerzinski, um, and sort of slammed them together in a sort of uh, mashup. And I, I thought for a long time, should I do a, a, a mashup of American names, which just, it sounded so entirely ludicrous. I decided to make just a note of that. So there's that. Um, there's a, There are references all over the place, but uh, three uh, cities are referenced here, Chita, Suchan, Karaganda. There are all three uh, sites where there were um, uh, prison camps. Um, and that should do it, that should do it. So this is a portrait of his his Moscow. Um, and, and after actually reading this poem, um, a friend in Cleveland said, gosh, it just seems like Cleveland, the dead rivers and the rest of it. So very industrial. So here it is. And this is our street. Let's call her, say, Argenikid Zerzinski, like any Soviet backwater, but it's also Moscow City. In the distance, the blocks bristle with ugly, heavy industry. Houses, pipes, building skeletons stubbornly crawl to the heavens. As you can see, nothing special. Drugstore, a line, shiner under a chick's eye. 
and that burning smell. The workers in crimson coveralls pave, break apart, and swear over the same road year after year. This is the masterworks author inhaling linden and gasoline as he lugs into the old store 14 empties for redemption. This is the good, no longer young, near saintly woman who leans a child's water can on flowers and looks outside onto the scene from the balcony's bower. Dinner simmers in the kitchen. In apartments, lies, lights blaze on. They have let her down often, these kin, these lovers, men. Like Tatiana, today it's my turn. We grew up here. Now we're just gloomy uncles and foolish aunts. We yearned, turned a bit perverted. This is our street, dear Lord, here with an Akujava record and the old Arbat sentiment. We give the world the finger only in our pockets and burn our hopes to ash like the Drevlian. With kids, we play geography, Chita, Karaganda, Suchan. Our faith, faces and clothes decay. The fishermen hang, linger at the long dead Yauza River. Such as this Yakna Patafa, the final round is ending soon in Lado, a flood so close you could almost touch it. And who's to blame for all this, Pushkin? We earned straight A's in this school of the science of shame and fear. Life will end and soon end and forever, the swearing and gossip will grow silent under the shared yard sky. But in this hellhole of a place, we knew a kindred orphanhood. So, by a birthmark, they would search for children in ancient days. All right. Uh, what I'm going to do now is actually play two poems back to back. I'll read the translations, and then we'll just be, we'll let Gonlewski sort of exist in his own parallel universe, such as he is. Um, but I just wanted you to hear just the mesmerizing gloriousness of Russian poetry and in, in its in its full um, full might. So, share screen, Sidyoja, take it away. Устроится на автобазу и пеет про черный пистолет. К старухе матери ни разу не завернуть за 10 лет. Проездом из газлей на юге с канистры кислого вина Одной подруги из Калуги заделать с дуру пацана. В рыгаловке рагу по средам, горох с треской по четвергам, Божиться другу за обедом, впаять за вгару по рогам, Преодолеть попутный гребень тридцатилетия, Чем свет возить налево лес и щебень, И петь про черный пистолет, А не обломится халтура, уснуть щекою на руле, С просонья вспоминая хмуро махаловку в Махачкале. Илегия, предпосланный эпиграф из Мандельштама. Не холодно, прозрачная весна. Апреля, цирковая музыка, трамваи, саксофон, вороны накроет кладбищами узкое за панибрата с похоронной. Был или нет я здесь по случаю, рифмуя на живую нитку, и вот доселе сердце мучаю, все пригодилось недобитку. И разом вспомнишь, как там дышится, какая слышится там гамма, и синий с предисловием дымшится, выходит томик Мандельштама, как раз и молодость кончается. Гербарный Василек в тетради, кто в США, кто в коме мается, как некогда сказал Сааде, а ты живешь свою подробную, теряешь совесть, ждешь трамвая, и речи слушаешь надгробные, шарф подбородком уминая, когда за даром тем и дорого, с экзальтированным протестом трубит саксофонист из города Неаполя. Видать проездом. All right, all right. Uh, so the third poem, to land a, a job at the garage, or Ustroyetsanaf Babazu, to land a job at the garage. 
to land a job at the garage and sing about my son. Not once in 10 years. <laughs> We've got Shen Young in the background there. <laughs> All right, uh, start over. To land a job at the garage and sing about a black gun and not once in 10 winters stop and see your old mom. En route from Gosley in the south, down a canister of booze, screw some girl from Kaluga and leave her when she's due. Gasseteria lamb on Wednesdays, cod piece soup on Thursdays. At lunch to vow to a friend to rough up the garage owner, then surmount the promising hill of a 30th birthday. At dawn to drive for black market gravel and sing the black pistol. And if you can't catch that gig, doze your cheek on the steering wheel, remembering with gloom and woe that Mahachkala brawl. So for those of you who are fans of um, sort of the, the beat era of poetry, I would say that Gamlevsky is definitely um, offering us a vision, a parallel vision of, of a generation of young people whose uh, moral compasses required them to sort of drop out of society and do sorts of um, the jobs that uh, that uh, that would be of no of no real purpose. Um, he felt that the Soviet Union was uh, morally bankrupt, and he did not want to contribute to it in any way. Um, at the same time, he was drawn by the the kinds of um, adventures and um, bohemianism that he saw and that we see throughout literature. And so uh, depictions like to land at the job at the garage is I think a persona poem in which uh, a, a guy that he he's actually met uh, on the road um, sort of presents himself as a character and, and Galevsky has sort of uh, voiced that character's uh, position. And that is not Galevsky himself, I don't think, but, um, but it sort of picks up on this kind of uh, the life of uh, people on the per periphery and the, the margins of the lumpen proletariat. Um, so here's here's one more poem. Um, maybe I'll, I'll read maybe two more poems. Um, and then I'd like to read just a little selection of prose. So this is Elegy or Elegia. This is the second one that he recited in that mix. Uh, the epigraph from Asap Mandelstam, great Russian poet of the early 20th century. Um, I'm cold, transparent spring is the epigraph. The circus music of April, trolleys, prose, saxophone, covers Musky Cemetery, invites itself to a funeral. Did you come by chance alone, rhyming by any means necessary? Till now your heart was a torment, but you'll take anything when desperate. Then you'll remember the bracing air, how the music floated around you, how the first Mandelstam appeared, prefaced by dim shits, slim, dark blue. And just like that, youth disappeared, a fragrant cornflower in a notebook. Who's in the US? Who's stuck in Comey, as the poet Saadi said way back? And you live your minute details, lose your honor, wait for the trolley, and listen to graveside spiels, chin crimpled down on your scarf. All the more dear, free of charge, the saxophonist from Naples blows his exalted, protesting blues. Must be passing through. Okay, uh, one, one last poem before I read a little bit of this, this memoir. Um, this is a poem that is new to this collection. Um, one of the things that I did when I was 20 years ago, I, I translated a work of Gonlewski's, but I, I didn't translate this poem because I couldn't make it work. Um, it too much depended on the music and the music didn't sound right. But over the 20 years of sort of growing, I think as a writer and as a poet and um, surrendering myself to the music, um, I decided to give a go at this poem. And, and so here's this, this version of um, this, this poem. By the way, most of his poems don't have titles. And this is a feature of Russian poetry that uh, that they're known by their first lines, not by a title. Of course, there there are poets who title their poems, but it is a huge lyric tradition of untitled poetry where the poem is simply known by its first line. In a poet's vegetal life, 
there is an un, sorry, start over. In a poet's vegetal life, there is an ill-fated phase when he shies away from heaven's light and fears only human judgment. From the bottom of an urban well, scattering grains to gray pigeons, he swears he'll give someone hell when he gets the chance. But then, thank God, on the dacha porch, where Jasmine reaches shoulder high, we learn from Vivaldi's seizures, fit a violin how to fly. And now an emptiness soars, and from the emptiness of height, the soul crashes down, passes out, till flowers tickle the shoulders. The truth is that we're dumb as dirt. We act like cowards, get plastered, from agitation snap matches, and out of weakness break dishes. We vow to speak the blunt truth point blank, as it is, not flatter. Yet a poem's no weapon of wrath, but a wellspring of silver honor. Okay. So, um, twice, about 20 years ago, I had an opportunity to go on very long uh, reading tours in the United States with Sergei Gunlevsky um, in 2003 and 2005. And it was an absolute delight for me as a youngish guy um, who had met him 10 years before and felt absolutely in love with his poetry and his model of being a poet. Um, I went to Russia in 1992 on a Watson Fellowship to study contemporary poetry and its relationship to the historical changes at that time and um, interviewed many writers, translated many writers, but Ganlevsky kind of stood head and shoulders above the others, kind of literally and figuratively, a very tall guy. Um, and uh, so when the opportunity came to not only translate more work, but get a, get a book published, um, we connected again and, and we went on this reading tour. And um, it was funny because Ganlevsky doesn't speak English almost at all. and kind of refuses to uh, as a point of honor, I suppose. And, you know, my Russian is pretty good, um, but um, but there's always a little bit of a language gap because of course he's a master of his language and, and I am a non-native speaker. Um, and so we were, uh, he, he called us uh, over the course of this tour, the, uh, the Charlotte, the two charlatans from uh, Mark Twain, um, you know, going to every town and trying to, apply our trade of uh, poems and translations. So here, here's a little bit of a window into some of that reality um, as I remember it from about 20 years ago. This is a chapter called Russian Lines and American Lines. To travel with a celebrated Russian poet is to be constantly on the hunt for coffee and cigarettes. Back in Manhattan, bleary from our minute in Madison and ready to head to an interview at a Russian TV station, we enter a packed Starbucks. Gonlevsky, itchy for caffeine, blows past the sleep-weary queue of customers and parks himself in front of the ca cash register. I tap him on the shoulder. Sergey, the line is over there, I whisper. This American line is so stretched out, he says. He hadn't noticed the line so full of holes. In Russia, if you're in line, you're so close you can get pregnant. The first time standing in line with Svetlana, my uh, host mother back in Russia, um, in the bread store on Sver uh, Tverskaya Street, I recalled reading about cues in Hedrick Smith's The Russians. Soviet cues have a dimension all their own, like the Egyptian pyramids, he said. More ominously, the accepted norm is that a Soviet woman daily spends two hours in line a day, seven days a week. In those stores, there was not one line, but three. One line for seeing what was available behind the counter, since everything was in fact behind a counter and untouchable to the grabbing masses. One line for the cash register, where you could pay for what you wanted, and one further line to receive what you'd spied and then paid for. And then you could ask someone to hold your spot in the second line while spying what was available in the first line so that the line itself could actually be twice or three times that length, depending on how many invisible customers were having their places held. The Soviet Union was dead, its head cut off, but everyone kept running around in these lines. The people had to eat. 
I recount this incident to Gonlewski years before on Tverskaya Street. Now, he says, on that street, all you can buy are diamonds, not a bread store anywhere near the place. In my time there, Tverskaya became the barometer of Russia's prosperity, the artery of commerce that ended right at the Kremlin wall. So where do people get food, I ask? Not in Tverskaya, he says. You can't eat diamonds. I can't imagine that, that avenue where I searched vainly for a simple cafe. The first time I came back from America, Gonlewski admits, I was surprised how it felt to be back in a Russian line. It's all boorishness, but it's good boorishness. Boorishness, chamstva, was a word I kept hearing in Russia and felt it even before I learned what it meant. Once I walked along an empty metro platform, a babushka waddled towards me, hauling two bags so full of groceries it was clear she intended to survive the next starvation. I was at least five feet from her with space to pass, but for reasons I can't explain, she kept vectoring in my direction until at last she wailed on me with her survival supplies. Shit, I muttered, my hips smarting from the blow. She didn't even turn back. Uh, at the table of my teacher, Dima, and his wife, Natasha, two Russian translators, I shared my adventure with the burly grandmother. Dima said, but this is just the way we walk. We want to be close to each other. It's pleasing to be surrounded by a crowd of people. You're anonymous and completely one with everyone else. Natasha just shook her dark head, sighing aloud, pouring tea and offering more apple pie. In her delicate English accent, cultivated from years of learning and adoring English in Moscow, classrooms, she said, boorishness. They're probably both right. This scene, the scene of my being shoved or struck by some grandma's baggage occurred so many times. By the time my family arrived on, in, on New Year's, I told them to expect being struck. If you get angry with them, I'd say, they will produce a state identity card explaining that they're an invalid. Perhaps these ladies have been struck so many times by other bags that they earned this special badge. One day, perhaps, I too could earn such a badge. Back in the Manhattan Starbucks, Gonlewski and I retreated to the uh, end of the only line and, with an American distance between ourselves and the last person, wait meekly for the coffee. The situation of lines is almost completely reversed in poetry. In Russian poetry, each line unscrolls freely, nearly always ending with a rhyme before it heads down to the next line. Even the line ends with a comma. Even if the line ends with a comma, there's a sense that one can rest a second before heading into what's next. In modern American poetry, lines careen into each other, employing enjambment with reckless abandon. Is it possible that Russian life surges too much to require enjambment, and what's really needed was the steadiness of a completed thought? When Gonlewski began to employ enjambment in his poems, even cutting off words in the middle, he was still governed by rhyme. I'm probably reading too much into the business of lines, except to say that Russian poetry always seemed like a place to escape from the madness of its civilization, a place where a musical order could reign and beauty and some secret illogical reason would win in the end. There's another couple scenes here. At the New York studio, the well-coiffed, white-haired Russian television host leans in meaningfully and says to Gonlewski, you're a genius. Well, Gonlewski stares at him as if he has two well-coiffed heads and then begins a series of jujitsu deflections. His interviewer slash interrogator keeps fishing for sound bites, but Gonlewski won't take the bait, refusing to be reeled in and chopped into bits. I've been contacted by the producer and it seemed like a golden chance for publicity. But looking at the control room monitors at multiple Gonlewskis being interviewed by multiple hosts, I know I've made a mistake. The first time I met Gonlewski outside Palyanka station in the spring of 1993, he was even more imposing than his photograph. He stuck the cigarette pinched in his hand between white his teeth while he shook my hand. With his other hand, the leash lashed around his fist. He held back his gigantic white boxer named Charlie, roughly the size of Cerberus. I was surprised how tall Gonlewski was. Most Russian men were diminutive, a head shorter than I, a chow-fed, vitamin-addled American. I craned my head up to face him. The truth is, 
Even if I were taller, I'd have felt as if I were looking up at him anyway, such as the self-shrinking gaze of idealization. On the way to his apartment, we stopped in a park to let Charlie slash Cerberus bark at smaller dogs and then passed an old monastery. Here, Gonlewski stopped short, pointed up to the crumbling roof and recalled spending an evening there, splitting a bottle of vodka with a drinking buddy. I thought of his poem, Twilight Came Late, which begins, or which has sort of toward the middle. On the pier, an old crone waits, breathing raw vodka, iron-toothed and helpful in searches for roofs. Thus will be my angel of death. That's the popular image of poets, that they are wild creatures. Bakhet Kanjeev, um, there's a Russian poet named Bakhet Kanjeev. Uh, once when the Russian scholar Anusa Milman was hosting the illustrious poet Kanjeev, she asked him in the hallway, right before his reading, whether he'd like a comb for his hair. It was sticking out like an untamed mane. Kinjayev scowled at her for a moment without a word and then proceeded into the auditorium. By, con by contrast, Gonlewski seemed orderly, his beard trimmed and hair buzzed short, and he was freshly washed. Inside Gonlewski's cozy apartment, his wife's Lena's earth tone sculpture filled floor to ceiling book bookshelves. I conducted my interview, nodding nervously at every word I understood as Gonlewski gamely gestured. The Soviet Union is dead, he said, but the Union of Soviets made me. His grandmother on his father's side was a Jew from the Ukraine. The family spoke Yiddish at home and lived in dirt and unhappiness. His grandmother had lost siblings during the pogroms. I'm anti-Soviet, he explained, but the paradox is that my family would never have happened except during the Soviet period, that the daughter of a priest would marry a poor Jew from Ukraine. And now I have the ironic position, he said, of being considered a Jew by the Soviet Union and a Goy by Israel. He was like me, I thought, a hybrid, not quite at home anywhere, neither in America nor in Russia. The name Gonlevsky, as it happens, comes from the Ukrainian word meaning revenue or earnings. They must have been peddlers, he surmised. Do you know what this means, he explained? I was born to be a charlatan. He was urbane, self-mocking, and larger than life. I told him that I thought his poems had captured the spirit of his age, but also felt something deeper in the poem, something universal, and asked him what he thought. I love Russian poetry very much, and I like what it's done, he said. Not because I am somehow attached to Russian or believe in the Russian idea. I am attached to Russian poetry like Kar Karadyanka, who, when he said, my homeland is Russian literature. Okay, I'm going to read one more poem, and then we can have some conversation. And I'm just going to read the last poem of the collection. It's quite short. Um, and it sort of reflects his uh, his late style, which I think is, is simpler than some of the um, pyrotechnics of the earlier poems, but also has lots of idioms that are, are very hard to translate, but a lot of fun to sort of play with and try to understand. Um, so this is where the title of the book comes from, Ochre and Rust. Bright ochre and rust delight these old eyes. Between roofs, a cloud grows out of itself. Wind gathers, drags leaves by their scruff, batters a fountain, a mag of expired styles. The blue autumn light, I dig it like no one. There's snow on the roof, but fire in the oven. What I would give to wait at the train for a stylish, black-coated, 20-ish woman. Well, thanks for listening. That was wonderful, Philip. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, it was just, it was so great to hear his voice and the depth of his voice and, mm -hmm. the, you know, on the video and also to be able to understand it through your voice and, and what a treat to have that, um, the memoir as well, and to get a sense of your travels and this, a sense of him as a person. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's so much personality that, you know, when poems are so packed with illusions and density of meaning, 
um, and, and mythology and mythography, self-mythology, that, um, that I almost feel like he's the sort of poet that requires a, a kind of memoir to go along with it. Um, yeah, thanks. And is the memoir published? Somebody asked where where that can be purchased. Well, yeah, um, the the entire like uh, the entire saga of our journey together has not been published, but that piece uh, does appear. Russian lines and American lines on uh, online. You'll find it at uh, on the seawall. Um, Russian lines and American lines. Um, if you just Google Russian lines, American lines, Galnevsky, Metris, it should go, it should show up. So, yeah. Yeah, I would add also that um, the book Ochre and Rust uh, does, it, Phil wrote a wonderful introduction for it. It's about 15 pages long. And it, you know, isn't a book length memoir, of course, about their experiences together, but he does um, go into to some of those experiences. It's quite, it's quite rich. Thanks, Christopher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there's so many illusions, there's so much history that um, that is important for um, for readers to get a little footing, you know, before they jump into these poems. Yeah. I, there's a few questions coming up in the chat, and um, do we want to go to those next, or Chris? Were there some questions you wanted to put to Philip first? Um. Well, maybe. Maybe I'll present one, and then we can we can go to the chat because I right. I do think that this will this will maybe help contextualize the the conversation a bit. Um, Phil has so this is his second um, book length translation of Gendlevsky's poetry. It was about twenty years ago. Um, he translated a kindred orphanhood, and maybe uh, Phil, you can talk a bit about your um, translation process. You mentioned that Sergei doesn't really speak much English, but is the process at all collaborative? To what degree is he sort of involved in the um, in in that in that work of bridging the two languages? Um, almost not at all. There, there was a period in the um, around the time we were doing the tour, and I was translating new poems where I peppered him with many questions, <laughs> and he was happy to uh, oblige. Um, however, you know, prior to that and since that period, uh, basically, I was um, asking a, a friend, a Russian poet who's also a translator, um, sundry questions, and um, because it, as as good as my Russian can be um, the elusiveness, the elusiveness of poetic speech and the elusiveness of literary language requires um, some help. So I was definitely, um, you know, showing it to my friend Dima, who was, uh, who kind of was along the ride with me. Um, and in terms of like the translation um, endeavor, I would say that you know, two things. One is that when I was young and living in Russia and thinking I was trying to be a poet, that Russian experience and reality so overwhelmed me that words simply uh, failed me. I, I just didn't have the language to describe or to um, articulate what I was seeing and what I was going through inside my own life and out on the streets and in the metro and um, the suffering of people, which was psychological and material, um, so I turned to translation because translation became a place where I could reside. I didn't have to create a world. All I had to do was find an, an analogous um, sort of language to, uh, to go along with that uh, language. And so I always encourage people to translate simply because you get to learn what it's like on the inside of poems and all the moves that a poet might make in a, in a poem. Um, I think probably early on, and what one of the reasons why I decided to retranslate some of these poems uh, was I was incredibly devoted and faithful to the specific language and sometimes um, were you know specific words um, that Gonlewski would be using um, in in a specific order even. And what I just decided as I kind of moved on as a translator was that um, I wanted to be as faithful to the music of the language 
as I was to the words. So that very first poem, if you felt a little confused by the content, like what's happening in this poem, I think that A, that's fairly typical of a Russian poem. That a Russian poem is glued together by sound, not by meaning, principally. Um, you can find the way to the meaning, but so much is, in, is, uh, is sutured by sound. Um, and so as a translator, I, I became more faithful to, I think, that, that soundscape and not worried so much about um, a kind of literalism that perhaps early on I felt uh, attached to, so. There is a question in the chat, Philip, from Karen McDermott about translating, talking about how um, Gundalevsky recites from memory and asking if the words migrate or change in ways that you as the translator have to edit your words. Right. I mean, part of it is that as a translator, your job isn't simply to mimic uh, the uh, the original, but sort of create a poem alongside in your own language. Um, and so um, sometimes that means taking liberty, certain liberties to um, to make that poem coherent in its own space. Um, I'm trying to think uh, some specifics here. Well, obviously, if it's idiomatic speech, you need to find idioms that are parallel. If you translate idioms literally, they become poetry. And that's actually not what it's like to experience the poem in the original language. Um, so this, uh, by any means necessary, someone noted in a subsequent question, is idiomatic in English, and he uses uh, an idiom, a parallel idiom in Russian. Um, so trying to do a little bit of that work to kind of uh, use parallel idioms. Um, because I think that Gunlevsky is as original as he is as a poet, uh, you know, fellow poets would say that part of his genius is in the ordinariness of the worlds that he creates and in the ordinariness of the speech that he reflects. Um, a spoken language, an idiomatic language, um, not a high style of language. Um, a sort of collision sometimes of the formalism of Russian and the uh, ordinariness and sometimes the kind of brute um, baseness of, of, of lived life um, as he experienced it. Um, so someone else asked about Gunlevsky's beat sensibility. This is Anna. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, in that original, Anna, he does reference Yakhnev Atafa. He would have read uh, Faulkner, of course, um, in translation, not in English. Um, and so, yeah, I think that word just uh, appealed to him as a sort of exotic, um, uh, self-created world, you know, that, that re reflected Faulkner's um, own, own world, own region. I think that Gunlevsky wanted, in some sense, to make his own Yakhna Batafa, but the Moscow version of Yakhna Batafa. Well, and, and was it also because of the fiction of it that he may be, you mentioned his, you know, the there's the fiction of living in Soviet Russia, and so you have to make a world for yourself. Yeah, Is yeah, that and that's, that's a fantastic point. And I would say, uh, absolutely, that that uh, of peoples, I would say Russians are particularly fond of and quite uh, excel in um, self-mythologizing. They are people who elevate the idea of Russianness to a kind of myth. Um, and so he himself, following in that tradition and seeing uh, reality and uh, literature as utterly suffused, as he says, you know, my homeland is Russian literature. He says that not simply because, you know, his homeland of Russian state power is toxic, but also because everywhere he sees literature. You know, there's this uh, famous poem by Alexander Bloch, uh, you know, um, and it has this line that, Noch, Ocherid, Fanad, and, uh, you know, it's like night, uh, I, actually, in the his, I, I can't even remember. Like night, you know. Uh, well, actually, no, Ochid is, isn't in the block, but uh, it says night. I can't even remember night street light something something. And Galuski in his um, 
I, I'm going to be 15 more minutes. Okay. 15 minutes? I think so, yeah. I don't think you have that much time. Well, maybe 10. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. All right. That's, hey, that's we, I do have to interview, say that, that Philip does need to go in 10 minutes um, to catch a plane. Um, but there yeah, are so, additional questions Chris or I can answer. We'll stay on oh, for a few minutes longer. I appreciate that. So G Gamlevsky kind of quotes the block, but uh, this word fanar in Russian means like streetlight, but in slang, it means like a black eye. And so he actually takes the block, which is this classic, beautiful, existential portrait of a knight uh, a moment in a city, almost like a, a hopper painting. And he turns it into this kind of base uh, realism of a world where women are getting hit, right? So it's this like, um, he he undercuts the literary and, and turns us back into the reality, the brutishness that people face on a day-to-day. -day. So that's just like one example of how he sees literary things everywhere, but he also wants to kind of tear them down or sort of bring them back down to size. Um, Autumn asked about the English equivalent of the meter he uses. So one of the things that I would say about meter in Russian poetry is that um, although it's it's a syllabotonic tradition by and large, you know, like uh, with um, meters that you can count, um, that uh, that. Russian poetry employs so many more meters than most contemporary poets. Like most contemporary poets might, you know, write perhaps an iambic, um, you know, in the Shakespearean sort of sonic name, da 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 da. Um, but uh, maybe in trochaic, if you're getting extreme, you're feeling heavy metal. Uh, but you know, very few of us are writing in anapests and dactyls unless we want to do something silly. Um, but in Russian poetry, it's quite regular and common to be employing all of these um, meters, and, um, and, and each of the meters has a kind of tonal resonance, um, which, if you use them, creates a certain kind of feeling uh, for a certain generations of uh, Russian readers. So, for example, there were... Um, uh, there were classic uh, Latin and Greek poets that were translated with uh, sort of like, you know, hexameters, dactylic hexameters and stuff like that. So when he uses dactylic hexameter, he's, um, he's referring to, and people feel that this is somehow a classic poem, even if the, the, the text itself, the subject itself does not feel like a classic subject it becomes infused with a kind of tonality and atmosphere of uh, classical uh, poetry. So unfortunately for many of us English readers, the, um, our, our tonal, um, our ability to hear those tones is sort of like, you know, people have listened to rock music and then they have to listen to Beethoven or Mozart. Like there's, there's no capacity for understanding, like simply the kind of symphonic complexity that, uh, that, that we're um, being uh, exposed to. So um, I tried my best to have sort of very light uh, metrical uh, experiences. So. Um, Philip, uh, I wanted to go back to an earlier question from yeah. Elizabeth Schaefer about um, has Gondolevsky felt threatened since Putin came to power? And there's a later question from Roger Lettington. If if the, if Putin's Russia is not a place where he feels comfortable, uh, do you think there was any period in Russian history when he might have felt <laughs> comfortable? <laughs> Maybe oh. take both of those questions. So what was the first question again? I, first I one was, um, does he feel unsafe since oh. Putin came to power? Right. Um, so Gunlevsky, as, um, as, as Meg mentioned in the introduction, um, it moved to the Republic of Georgia um, because, and in fact, moved his family there, his um, son and his daughter and their families, um, because 
you know, the Sun was involved in the pro-democracy movements of the early 2010s. And, uh, you know, Putin was radically cracking down on those uh, on those protests. And he just decided, like, I mean, after living a whole life there, really committing himself to, to living a Russian and a Moscow life, that uh, he just wanted to not deal with this anymore. Um, is it unsafe for a poet uh, in particular? I would say it is unsafe for anyone who puts their head above the parapet in a public way to condemn, denounce uh, Putin as uh, uh, as an autocrat or a dictator. I mean, it is. It's uh, you know, it is not safe for um, for people to do that. Um, and so, um, but as a as a poet, he he actually did get arrested for um, not too too long ago. He was in the Moscow metro, and they had plastered up. Uh, posters of Stalin. And he said, this is insane. You know, like, what is this? And so he just tore them down and he got arrested and detained and he was let go. But that was an early sign that that um, very little, uh, well, that, that, I mean, autocracy was back, that Stalin was back as a figure uh, to be admired and that, um, uh, that, uh, that the world that he knew was no longer, um, that the Russia that he knew was no longer one that he would want to be participating in. Um, so, yeah, and if there's an era that he would have lived, I know that he loves Pushkin. Pushkin, like so many Russians uh, who love Pushkin, was his favorite poet. And it's a little atavistic to say, of course, because Pushkin is so much of a traditionalist and not a traditionalist. Pushkin became a Soviet hero in this weird way, even though Pushkin himself probably would have not liked the Soviet Union at all. Um, so I'm sure that Gonlevsky would have loved to meet Pushkin, but of course, <laughs> the, the era of the czars was uh, no picnic as well for free speech. So, um, yeah. yeah. I, I know that you have to get going. Uh, is there any last comment or few lines or whatever that you would like to leave us with before you go and um i'm just grateful for your attention um i there are certain lines that i you know hold on to even if you don't in, understand the entirety of a poem there there are lines that you can sort of live by like the ones when he says um you know and just like that youth ended a fragrant cornflower in a notebook. I just like hold on to that all the time in life. And sometimes that's all you need. It's just a few lines to make you feel like you understand uh, the mystery and strangeness of what it means to be alive and the work that poetry can do to help us attend to that mystery and strangeness, that beauty, that difficulty such as it is. So thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you so much for being here, Philip, and for bringing us this translation and that wonderful foreword that Chris mentioned that um, helps helps us enter this poetry of Gondolevsky. So, thank you so much. And please, anybody who wants to ask me any further questions, just reach out. Um, you know, I'm I'm available, and I'm sure Chris or Meg can can connect us. So, great. Thank you for doing All that. Right. Best wishes. Thank you, Thanks Philip. Again, both of you. Safe Max. travels. Thanks. Great to hear you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so Chris and I will stay on for a few minutes if there are questions or comments that we can answer. I mean, I just think there are probably a million questions I I would ask, you know, and maybe a, a, I'll ask you a couple and we'll see if there are others in the chat. But, you know, what moved you to... Um, this was selected as the winner of the Stephen Mitchell Prize. What moved you to publish this collection, Chris? Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Um, yeah, so Green Linden Press does have it's it's a new series. This was the ex, this was the inaugural um, selection, but we do have a, a series in translation. Um, there are three books in the series now. And this was the inaugural winner of the Mitchell Prize um, and a, a fourth coming out later this year. But um, 
it, it came up at some point in in some of the things that Phil said that there's just there are qualities of poetry in any other language that are beautiful, mesmerizing, uh, different from our experience of poetry in English, despite how various those those poetries can be in one language. And um, I, you know, as a reader of poetry for so long, I've admired um, those books. Sometimes they're out of print, sometimes they're recondite and uh, where, where you can get a sense of what another language is like, what another culture is like, what another worldview is like in a way that, you know, you, maybe you'd never experience it uh, on your own without that, that window or doorway into it. And as a publisher of poetry, of course, then I wanted to, to participate in that kind of magic. Um, so we, feel very fortunate to have had Stephen Mitchell's blessing, a wonderful um, human being, but obviously wonderful translator. If you're not um, familiar with his work, do check it out. Stephen Mitchell is a translator. Um, we also have a recent book by Pierre Alferi, translated by Cole Swenson. Um, the Poets' Corner hosted us about a year ago, as Meg mentioned. Uh, Mark Burroughs translated the selected poems of Hilda Domine, wonderful um, uh, 20th century German poet who is so well known in Germany, but not well known in English. And so we're really excited to bring out two, there are actually two books of hers, selected poems came out in English at the same time, curiously. And uh, so now her work is widely available in English. And then later this year, the, um, the, the most recent recipient of the Stephen Mitchell Prize is um, um, Rebecca Seiferly is the translator of a new selected poems of um, Federico Garcia Lorca that will come out towards the end of 2024. I think it's interesting what you say about understanding another worldview through poetry and through the translation of poetry and been reading lately about lost languages and languages that are threatened by extinction and and what we lose by losing those languages but there are languages that are alive and healthy today that we lose the world view of if we don't have a chance to experience them and experience them. You know, sometimes the only way we can experience them is in translation, especially many of us who don't re really have another language available, accessible to us. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I, I would add this other kind of piece to to my response and that is um a few years back uh the book was published in 2021 so and i worked on it for a couple of years prior so maybe five years ago i started this project of um, an anthology of iranian poetry um iranian poetry and poets of the iranian diaspora and um in that in editing that i was looking for translations of the poet Nima Yushij, who's one of the great Iranian poets of the 20th century. I mean, it's not hyperbole to say he, he altered the direction of Iranian poetry. He, he by himself changed, changed it. He was that kind of significant. And yet you can't find much translated into English and some of the translations that you do find aren't that good, honestly. And I was sort of mystified. Well, how can how can that be? Um, and you know, it was my own naivete there. But the the point being that there are so many great literatures, so many great poetries that we don't have access to um, in other languages. There's a lot that just isn't translated, even if it's wonderful. Um, and so my. Go, go, ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, so the, my one of the intentions then of the 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 Stephen Mitchell translation series is to to try to make those less um, less um, insular and try to bring them to people. You know, I, especially places like Iran, Russia, that we 
politically are so estranged from at war with or whatever yeah. um that that to understand the voice of the people is not the voice of the politics so um that's helpful to for all of us so i thought maybe because it's part of your essential voices um series i think the next month you could give us a little preview of that publication and let us know why you decided to um publish essential queer voices in u.s poetry yeah thank you for bringing it up and thank you again for um hosting us there's going to be five poets um the the book the anthology was published uh just last month beginning of february and um it has 100 poets they're all living poets and um yeah I, the part of that essential voices series the intention of it is to um present sort of a counterpoint to what i perceive to be uh, misunderstandings and misrepresentations in the broader culture and uh you know, it's sort of paradoxical times for queer people in the United States, because on the one hand, we have more um, visibility and more freedoms than we have historically. And at the same time, um, there's a pretty remarkable backlash to those freedoms and to that visibility. And it's dangerous. Um, it's politically dangerous. It's personally dangerous. And so uh, I was reading, there was something like 500 laws that were trying to be passed um, just last year um, to curtail uh, some of those freedoms of, of um, gay, lesbian, transgender people. And, you know, it's, it's, um, pretty disturbing so what do the poets have to say about it is who who i like to hear from and so the book really brings together it, it, i wanted to make it as diverse as i could um, in reflection of um, the diversity of the united states and so there's you know racial racial and ethnic diversity of course but i'm looking for generational diversity too so there's you know some of our our sage older poets and some of our really exciting young newer poets um four generations of poets in the book and urban poets and rural poets and academic poets and blue collar poets and to really just sort of show the the variousness of perspectives um and you know some of it's overtly queer and and some of it isn't at all so the point wasn't just to you know get poems about being queer because um the the when i when i use the word essential in the the name of the series um i what i really want to harken back to is the latin root essentia which means being so i don't only mean it to mean that like these are the best or among the best of the writers but that these poets are sort of getting at what it means to be human. Well, and you have a hundred poets in that. Class. There are a hundred poets in the book. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's not a slim volume. <laughs> no. And, and to think about that many voices, you know, representing the, that aspect of our lives that is wonderful. And the five that have, um, are planning to read next month are terrific poets and ones that I admire and so much. So I'm really glad to to be doing that uh, at this point. Yeah, no, I and, agree absolutely. They're they they're all world class poets. It's quite a lineup. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. So I think with that we would um, probably want to close today's conversation. I thank you so much, Chris, for, for bringing us Philip and Sergey um, in video form, but hearing his voice I just was amazing. Yeah. And um, coming back next month with even more to richness in poetry. 
And I want to thank you, Meg. All yeah. the people that came. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you again. All right. Well, thank you all for coming and I hope to see you again soon. <laughs>